Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, our Wednesday night service. I, I love it. You're all uniquely sectioned today. You know, you've kind of got a section here and a section here. But glad to have each and every one of you here tonight. Um, there may be some people that had complications. There are some power outages on the south end of town right now that are creating some uniqueness for some people. And uh, so anyway, but I'm glad that you're here. We're going to start by singing. Let's stand together. Brother Jim Grew is going to lead us in a song. Number 250, let's all stand, please. He keeps me singing or singing. 250. All together. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken string, stirred the stumbling cords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. I go, feasting on the riches of His grace, resting neath His sheltering feet, always looking on His smiling face, that is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing tonight. We're going to begin with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll continue on. We're going to be singing another song in just a second. Uh, we'll be merciful. We'll let you sit down for that one. Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather in your house, and we do pray, Lord, for the needs of our church family. We also do pray, Lord, uh, for uh, the needs of our community right now. We pray, Lord, as we have this power outage and we have this uh, grass fire that's disrupted a part of our town uh, this afternoon and we pray for anybody who it may be complicating their lives right now that you would be a help to them and uh, we do pray Lord for those who are still trying to make it to service tonight that you would give them safety in their travel as well and I pray that you would encourage us through your word encourage us to do the right thing encourage us in our hearts and certainly, Lord, that you would hear us as we pray to you and that you would answer these many, many requests that we have. Mm -hmm. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. We're going to sing uh, He's Able, number 261. It's a chorus, so we'll sing it through twice. 261. Able, I know he 
captive free. He made the lame to walk again, caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able, he's able. Set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again, caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able. I know he's able. Okay, let's do a few things real quick here. First is this. Is there anybody you need a prayer bulletin? You did not get a prayer bulletin tonight. You snuck by the usher and did not make it. You've got one there and got those there. Okay, so that's item number one. Just a second. I've got, sometimes I check things out here because I have all these little wires and they tug on me and I want to make sure nothing falls apart on me here. So, um, uh, glad to have you here. We have guests here today. Um, and I already said this, Johnsons, meet the Johnsons. And uh, we have here, this is, this is Pastor Tim and Chastity Johnson. Uh, Brother Johnson is the pastor of Florence Baptist Church. Hard to believe, brother, because we haven't lived that long. But I know you've pastored the church for well over 20 years now. And, uh, and, so, and you haven't aged today. I don't know what happened to me. Uh, first, my hair turned gray, then started turning loose. So anyway, glad to have you folks uh, down from the Bitterroot Valley. By the way, the Bitterroot Valley in Montana is a beautiful, beautiful valley. And it's just a wonderful place. And so now you know if you ever, for some reason, need to visit the Bitterroot Valley, you know where to go to church right here. And then if I go just, if I leapfrog here, uh, this is Larissa. And this Larissa is the daughter of... Tim and Chastity Johnson, and so Larissa is here uh, with her three boys right here. You guys, look how hard you worked. You worked hard. I can't believe the color coordination. You did such a good job on your shirts. Did you have to go out there and dye your shirts this afternoon? Nope, they said somehow that worked. It's amazing. Uh, good to have you here. And then this is Mr. Kevin Hernandez, who for some reason likes to sit with these people. I haven't quite figured out why that is yet I guess he he I you know I guess he's he's friendly to the guy he's sitting beside there but I think he likes I think he kind of likes the lady that's sitting beside him as well and so anyway and so and part of it is just kind of this little glow that goes on right there that's part of the problem so anyway um but they're visitors. Wait a minute, they're visitors. And Natalie, welcome back. Good to see you. But Natalie has been gone long enough that we can consider a visitor as well. And so Caleb, if you uh, run back there, Glenn, can you help? I know Caleb's already got it. He's got it. Man alive, working graveyard shift. He's wide awake. It's amazing. And uh, anyway, so I'm counting there. One, two, three, four. I'm just going to need four of them. Uh, four of them, uh, because you give them to the young boys, they'll use them for footballs. Um, but uh, anyway, so what do we do, class, with our visitors? We mug, we mug our visitors is what we do. So anyway, and so we want to make sure that you get those and that you have those. And uh, those are nice beverage cups. We purposely tried to kind of master color the color of coffee. And... Um, yeah, or, or just, uh, you know, a very strong tea works too, as well as pens, but glad that you're here. 
Uh, I know the man times a mile on that. I know how far you had to travel to get here. And so anyway, be in prayer for them. They're going to be here, and then they're headed to the, to the Oregon coast, be there for a couple days, and then they're coming back on Mother's Day, and Sunday night, uh, Brother Johnson's going to be preaching, and uh, so anyway, we'll be glad to uh, have them there and see quite a bit of you. Uh, we probably spent way too much time reminiscing last night, and so had a wonderful time with that. And uh, so let me give you some announcements here, some important things that you need to know, and that is Saturday. Let me start with Saturday. You know there was an extra announcement. Oh yeah, okay, I'll remember that, and then we'll send out a text on that. Saturday is the mother-daughter luncheon. That is starting at noon, and uh, just be, if there's any kind of changes, Confirm that with Mrs. Watkins. She really, really would like to know if there's any kind of changes. But ladies, you're going to have a wonderful time. Um, I know what you're going to eat. And yes, men, we do pray for leftovers. We do. Because uh, I, I know what the meal is. And so they're going to have a wonderful time. Uh, Mrs. Vicki Mutchler, um, wife of Pastor Mike Mutchler, is coming to speak. And uh, you will have a wonderful time there. Now, there will be, and I'll just let you ladies know they're here right now, there will be a donation basket uh, that will be there at the meeting. That donation basket is not for the food. That donation basket is a love offering for the guest speaker, Mrs. Mutchler. And so just letting you know that that will be taking place. And then men, there will be an alternate activity at the Glenn Miller Farm. It is an alternate activity. If you want to know what is taking place during that alternate activity, uh, you can talk to Brother Miller, and uh, Brother Miller will tell you the details of the alternate activity uh, that will be taking place with the men. Now, men, on Saturday morning, we still will have our men's prayer and coffee. We will not have it in the fellowship hall. We are banished from the fellowship hall. We will probably move into Mr. Hernandez's classroom, and we will have men's coffee and prayer there at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday. So letting you know uh, that that item's coming place. Also on Mother's Day, and this is important, we are receiving a love offering, and this love offering is for... Uh, the property of Pastor Ron Reisner of Bridgeway Baptist Church in Vancouver, Washington. He is purchasing a property, and we're trying to help with that. And so again, that love offering will be on Sunday. Any gifts you have for that will go to the Clifton J. Cooley Memorial Fund. So you put on your tithe envelope, Memorial Fund, it'll get there. Put on it, Cooley, it'll get there. Uh, if you put on it, I don't know, it won't get there. It could go anywhere. And so just uh, letting you know about those things that are taking place. Also, I'm just going to make mention of this, any of you interested in that, and that is in Missoula, Montana. And I believe it's like the 24th or the 25th, trying to get my math right here. Okay, just a second here. We're going 9th, we're going 16th, 23rd, 24th and 25th. There is a preaching conference at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Missoula, Montana, and that would be uh, Brother Tony Hudson and Brother Daryl Cox, and some of us are going, so if you're interested about details about that, uh, just letting you know that. And begin praying about the I Love America conference, which is going to be the last Monday, Tuesday in June. I'm working really, really hard to finalize the artwork that's going to be going on uh, the posters and the postcards that are going out for that. So just kind of letting you know all those I things that are going on up front. Again, for any potential new student of Faith Bible Institute, um, registration is open for any new students right now. And I like to think I remembered everything I need to talk about right now. I may not have, but I like to think uh, that I have. And so at this time, uh, Brother Jim Grew is going to come and lead us in another song. All right, we're going to stand once more before the message, number 223. Draw me nearer, 223.
Bibles tonight to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 the book of Ephesians chapter 4 as you turn there again just um, uh, one other thing regarding the mother-daughter luncheon I know uh, that there are some special gifts that the attenders of that luncheon will receive and then of course on Mother's Day uh, every lady every mom that comes every mother every mom that comes uh, to the Sunday morning service will be receiving something as well and to those of you that are here, remember your mom. Remember your mom this weekend. Remember your mom on Sunday. Uh, send her a card or send her a well wish. If you're, if you're children here, and, and I've already talked to some of the children, I said, you guys got to have a plan. You got to have a plan for mom for Mother's Day. Don't let that come and go, you know. Uh, try to make breakfast, burn toast, do something and let you know that you thought about your mom on Mother's Day. You know, you, you know better. You, can, you don't have to burn toast. So anyway, but just, uh, but just remember those things. Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 17 uh, this evening, uh, dealing with an important subject. Uh, reality is that over the last year we have gone through such a a difficult and chaotic time uh, that for many people the wheels have just kind of come off um, you know uh, some people walking up and down the street right now you go well they're they're just not quite right and and you're absolutely correct they're not quite right and uh, sometimes we need to even take inventory of ourselves and, you know, and see whether uh, we've leaned hard to port or starboard or we're just a bubble off a plum or something like that. We can need to take inventory of ourselves and we need to look inside ourselves and say, is everything okay? And take evaluation. Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth, it means from this time forward, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, 
have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please help me as I describe your word and as we look in practicality on our own lives, on our own hearts, your Son, our Savior, has said about us, ye are the light of the world. And without us, there will be no light of any kind. So help us to shine as those lights in the darkness. Help us not to become darkness, but help us to be the light that we're supposed to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When we look at this phrase here, and it makes this statement that ye from this time forward walk not as other Gentiles walk. And the term Gentiles here is being used for those who have not received Christ as their personal Savior. For those who have not been born again and it's saying from Paul is saying from this time forward live differently than you used to live and then it goes on and to describe what the former lifestyle was what the time past was what the before being saved lifestyle was and one of the things that it talks about is it talks in this passage about the sinner's heart and it says the sinner's heart, before a person is saved, first of all, it says the heart is blind. That the sinner's heart has not a thimble full of spiritual discernment. Has no spiritual perception. And then it describes it even worse. It talks about that the sinner's heart, the lost person's heart, gets to the point where it feels absolutely nothing. It says it is gone past feeling. One of the interesting things is, if you hear about a lot of these mass shootings, and those that were close enough to see the mass shooter and lived, they say they have an empty look in their eyes. And even some of those people, when they're interviewed, they said, well, what were you doing? What were you feeling when you did that? And those that would admit they did it, they said, well, I felt nothing. And it's important to see that sin can bring a person to the point where they don't feel anything anymore. And it says being past feeling, they've given themselves over to lasciviousness. And the idea of lasciviousness is they've given themselves completely over to a lawlessness and a wantonness, almost an, almost an animistic gratification of themselves and the flesh. And it goes on and it says this, they, to work all uncleanness with greediness, and it means they've literally got to the point where all they can think about is what's good for them, what feels good for them, what can they get, and they've gone past the point of feeling anything regarding God, feeling anything regarding anything else, and you go, well, how could that happen? And it's easy. The Bible describes it. Their heart is a rock. Their heart is a stone. And I don't know about you, but my understanding is if you, if you do CPR on a stone, it's still going to be a stone. And you know, and if you take those paddles of life and hit them, uh, he, you know, go ahead and get the voltage up to 400 millijoules or whatever it is, and you shock that rock, all you've got is a shocked rock. You don't have anything else, nothing else going on at all. In Ezekiel 36 was a prophecy regarding what would happen when the Holy Spirit of God would come and indwell the born-again believer, it's a prophetic description of the born-again experience and what happens to the born-again believer's heart, the before and after in Ezekiel chapter 36, looking at verse 26, 
where the Bible says this, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And what you have here is the born again experience where prior to be boring prior to being born again, your heart was a rock. And after being born again, you have a heart that of flesh, a heart that feels, and a Holy Spirit of God within you that discerns, and that heart that was a rock knew nothing about the law of God, had no ability to follow the law of God. Now you have the Holy Spirit of God. Here's the interesting thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. And he, the Holy Spirit, knows every single word that is written in here. And that is why in the before and after experience, the before being born again and the after being born again, all of a sudden, people begin to sense certain things that are written in the Word of God before they actually read what is written in the Word of God. And they begin to get a sense of right and wrong, get a sense of morality in their lives, and they begin to make moral choices and moral decisions without even having a chapter or verse what the moral decision is. This happens as a pastor much more over and over again. And that is, you know, he would lead a person to Christ and they'd be in church for a little while. And then all of a sudden they'd come up to, come up to Pastor Mutcher and said, I want you to know I quit smoking. And Pastor Mutcher would say, well, that, well, praise the Lord, that's good. And Pastor Mutcher says, I haven't preached against smoking. And another person come up and said, Pastor, I've quit drinking. And he would think in his mind, well, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't preach this Sunday on drinking. But it's because the Holy Spirit begins to work and it begins to do a moral overhaul in the born-again believer and they begin to get a sense of right and wrong. I still remember, you know, there was a young couple and they're up in Montana and they were involved in a live-in relationship which the Bible calls fornication, calls it sin and immorality against God where you have a man who is not married having sex with a woman that is not married which the Bible calls sin and calls it grievous against the Lord. And all of a sudden this man came up to me and says, Pastor, the way I'm living isn't right. I need to get married. I've, I've been with this lady for five, six years. We need to tie the knot. I thought, well, I didn't preach on that. But it's what the Holy Spirit of God begins to work in a person's life. Now there's a problem. And here's the problem. Before you were saved, your heart was a rock. And God gave you a heart of flesh. And since you got saved, the devil has one goal for your life. And the goal that the devil has for your life is to turn that heart into a rock again. And so he is trying everything. He is trying spiritual Portland cement and hardeners and everything he can to try to get that heart to become a rock again. So here's the question, and this is the message. Does your heart feel anything? Because I tell you what, with the mess we've been through, it's sometimes easy to get just a little bit numb with everything that's going on. And so we're going to do a heart exam right now. And I'm going to ask you, and one of the things is, we need to see if your heart feels certain things. So let me ask five questions regarding the heart tonight. The first one, turn with me to Exodus chapter 35. The book of Exodus chapter 35. And you know, it's amazing what God can do regarding the heart. And uh, this certainly is not an exhaustive message. Those of you who are with me for Brian Baptist Institute maybe uh, four years ago, we did a six-week series on the heart. Heaven help the heart. We certainly don't have time to do that. But, but I do want us to observe a few things that we're looking at here. Exodus chapter 35 and looking at verse 21. Exodus 35 and look at verse 21. 
And we're talking about the children of Israel here. We're talking about the faithful people of God. Something happened to the faithful people of God. In verse 21, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up. And everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets, and earrings, and rings, and tablets, and jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And... Um, you know, in, in some ways, I kind of like this because if you continue to read this, what you'll find out if you look at Exodus 36, verse 5. We have an offering that's gone out of control. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, and you find the very first and last time in human history that an offering was stopped. I don't think it's ever happened ever again, but it happened right here. But it happened, and this is the first question. Is your heart stirred by need? And meaning, when a need arises, does God stir your heart and give you a yearning or a desire to meet a need? It's a heart exam. You know, do, do you have compassion? Do you have a, a desire in this scenario to, to make a difference? Do you see that there's a deficiency and do you have a desire in your heart to want to fill it? Does your heart feel anything when a need arises? Um, Dr. Jack Treber of Santa Clara, California, North Valley Baptist Church, he has about every kind of different offering known to man. And somebody said, Dr. Treber, your congregation is going to hate offerings. They just won't do it anymore. And he has all sorts of different varieties. And sometimes it's a, you know, a bus ministry offering. And sometimes it's a building offering. And sometimes it's a debt retirement offering. And sometimes, if it, listen, there's a bunch of preachers coming for a preaching conference. We're going to have a Starbucks coffee card offering. And um, he said, why do you do that so much? And he says, because different believers' hearts are stirred by different things. No, some are stirred by missions and missionaries. Some are stirred, stirred by building and facilities. Some are stirred by something else, something different than happening. He says, you don't know exactly what's going to stir the heart, but I've discovered that different people stir things, stir different hearts of different believers. And Dr. Treber will plainly say, if I present a need and your heart isn't stirred by that one, fine, I'll present another one and you'll be stirred by the next one. That's just how he operates. And, but the reality is, somewhere along the line, the born-again believer's heart should be stirred by some need, sometime, somehow, the believer should feel something. Now, some, like in this situation, they're stirred to give. Some are stirred a different way. Look with me at Exodus chapter 36, verses 2 and 3. And it says this, And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free will offerings every morning. Some people, their heart is stirred by the need, but they're not there to necessarily give something. They're there to do something. And by the way, that is incredibly important as well. I mean, sometimes throwing money at it isn't going to solve the problem. Sometimes it's going to take elbow grease. You know, I still remember, sometimes we will have, uh, twice a year, 
we will have an all-church work day, and I'm still very, very impressed with how much you folks get done in a single work day. It blows my mind. But sometimes I plan the work day, sometimes the work day plans me. Uh, about five years ago, we are getting ready for a men's work day, and I was out there, and I was staging all the supplies and all the tools, and this huge windstorm came right down the Umatilla River here, just reared up, and all of a sudden I heard a great crack and a crash, and one of those big cottonwood tree branches, uh, Brother Johnson, you understand cottonwood tree branches, that's why I preach on five terrible uses for cottonwood, anyway, and it was rotted out in the middle, and it broke off, and it took out one of the office windows, and I went, oh, well, I guess I have something added, I'm sure glad I'm having a work day today. And fortunately, there are people that came, and there are men who knew what to do, and okay, we know how to meet that need. But it's important. The first question is this, about does your heart feel anything? And that is, is your heart stirred by need? And I don't mean, oh, that person has a need. I hope someday, somebody, somewhere, does something about that. Is your heart stirred by the need? Could be to give, could be to work. And then a little bit different than work, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 25 and 26. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 25 and 26. Uh, the children of Israel made a bad decision. The bad decision was they rejected God as their king and decided they wanted a physical earthly king. But God said, okay, we're going we're gonna to get you what you want here and we're going to find you a king. Um, it's not going to be, uh, there's not going to be a vote. There's not going to be a stuffing of ballots. Um, there's, uh, you know, we're just going to, we're going to find you a king. We're going to anoint you a king. And so this happened and Saul was picked to be the first king of Israel. And if you read the passage, Saul was not a very good leader. He's not a very good king. However, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. That is maybe an incredibly important pivotal verse in scripture regarding leadership and regarding what God can do. Now, we have the documentation of scripture that Saul was not a very good king. We have the documentation of scripture that Saul was not a very good leader, but he still functioned fairly well and ruled the kingdom fairly well because God stirred the hearts of of certain people. There is absolutely nothing that can ever be done by leadership without help. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, there are no one-man shows, there are no dog and pony shows. We have all the drama that Moses went through that proved that even Moses couldn't be a dog and pony show. We have the section where Moses' arms got heavy and had to be lifted up we have another one where Moses' father-in-law actually gave him some good advice and said, listen, you're going, to, you're going to waste away and you're going to die unless you get some help. And so everywhere in leadership, help is absolutely necessary. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that the leadership is that great, but God has the ability to stir a heart. And so do you feel anything? Does God stir your heart to help? Do you have the ability to see where there is a gap or there is a shortage or there's a deficiency and say, you know what, I'm looking at that person who is doing that thing and they can't do it on their own. They need help. I think God is stirring my heart to help. Every leader, even the poor ones, need help. Thirdly, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. The book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 36, uh, Peter's first sermon, obviously 
a Holy Spirit-driven sermon with great results here. And something that every pastor hopes happens with a sermon. Peter is speaking to the children of Israel. He's speaking to the Jews. Some of them that helped put Jesus on the cross in a very real tangible way. It said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's the third question. Is your heart pricked by sin? And it literally means when sin takes place, and particularly in your own life, does it bother you? In the case of these Jews here, they realized they'd sinned against God, and it really, really bothered them. And I didn't say, does the sin of the person across the aisle from you bother you? I said, does your own sin bother you? Because it is the job description of Pharisees to be bothered by every sin but their own. The question is, does your sin bother you? The question for me, does my sin bother you? There's another phrase that's similar to this. This is pricked in the heart. Also in the Old Testament, another word they use, I kind of like it, is smote. Their heart smote them. And it's used twice regarding King David. And it says, one, King David's heart smote him when he cut off the garment of Saul, when Saul went hiding, went into a cave, and David was there. David could have killed him, but he cut off the garment. But he still was the king. He still was the leader, a poor leader, but he still was the leader, and he still was God's anointed. And it says, David's heart smote him. I like the word smote, because you know what? When you smite somebody it literally means somebody comes up Kevin I could use you for an example but I won't use any examples on this but literally somebody comes up and you smite them yes smack them and so it's literally like David's heart came out of his body and smacked him and said what are you doing and it's the same thing when another time when David's heart was smote because he numbered the people, which was completely against the law of God, he wasn't supposed to do it, and it said David's heart smote him when he numbered the people. And so it's the idea of conviction of sin. Do you feel anything when you sin against God? Does it bother you? Fourthly, Luke chapter 24, verse 30 Luke 24, looking at verse 30, we have the men on the Emmaus Road, and um, I still really like, I really like this story because the resurrected Christ appears to them, and, and they're talking to him, and he's just playing along. And I, and I really kind of like it. I think about it, you know, it's Jesus, it's the resurrected Christ. And the men are saying, haven't you heard what's been going on here? And he just, rather than saying, yeah, I know, he just says, what things? Tell me about it, you know? And I, and I kind of like that. And we get farther and farther along and he begins to speak to them and he begins to preach to them and he begins to share the word of God with them. Look at verse 30. It says, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them and their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. First of all, I want to paint the picture here. Okay, when you go out to break bread, your hands are exposed. I wonder if they saw the nail prints. And I wonder if they went, and then poof, he was gone. But here's the interesting statement. And they said one to another, they had their V8 moment, and they said, did not our heart burn within us while they talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? What it meant is while he was talking to them, they felt something. They didn't know what it was, but the word of God was being spoken to them by the Son of God, and their heart 
was stirred and they felt something in their heart. They felt a burning in their heart. They felt something inside, whether it be an excitement or a conviction or just some overarching feeling. They felt something. And here's the question. Does your heart burn due to the transforming truth? Can the word of God stir your heart and make you excited or make you convicted or make you draw you in, make you curious or make you attentive? Can your heart do that? Does the word of God do that? Does something happen? Do you feel something when that happens? There was a lady that came to the very first church that I uh, preached at, Stevensville, Montana. There was a lady who came to the church um, several years ago. Her last name, by the way, was Miller. There's a lot of Millers around. And, um, and she came to church that Sunday. And, you know, I was just preaching, just preaching the word of God. I, I didn't know her. She had never come before. I didn't know what was going on in her life. And um, um, in that sanctuary, it was really, really tough to get down an aisle. Uh, there were no aisles on the sides. The pews just went against the wall. And uh, people were sometimes, they looked like they were crammed like sardines. And, and uh, the, the middle aisle, I don't even know, was as wide as this aisle. And so it was hard for people. And so often when people wanted to speak to me, they spoke to me after service. And after service was over, uh, this lady came up and I talked to her in the choir loft, and she was crying so hard. She is, she is physically shaking. Tears were going every which way, and she recommitted her life to Christ. And I, I never really knew entirely what she experienced, just that after that, that she was really pretty faithful to church, and, and she brought her unsaved husband to church. I still hope to this day that he eventually got saved. But about a year later, she wrote me a card. And she said, I had drifted away from God. But when I came to church and I heard the preaching of the word, I felt something. And she said, my heart was pounding so hard because I knew the Holy Spirit of God was speaking to me. And she felt something. And the question is, do you feel something when the Word of God is interacting with your life? One other thing. Psalm 73, verse 21. Psalm 73, and we live in a difficult age of great deception. Where sometimes we just get things wrong. But when you realize it, do you feel anything? Psalm 73, verse 21. I often call this Asaph's fable. Because Asaph was the music director of the children of Israel. And he got things wrong. He looked at, uh, he looked at too many of the unjust things in the world. He looked at uh, wicked rich people getting wicked richer and he looked at things that were just seemed unjust, didn't seem right, and he thought, what am I doing serving God? What am I doing? I am the choir director and I'm starving to death and if I do anything wrong, I can't get away with anything. Why am I doing this? And he almost went off the rail. And he said, then he went to the house of God and he heard the word of God and he had a eureka moment and he had a realization of what God was really about and that nothing escapes God. He sees it all and he will deal with it all. And when he realized this, he felt something. In verse 21, it says, thus was my heart grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. He said, I might as well have been a dog or even worse, a cat. He says, I, I just wasn't able to think through anything. 
Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. And so, is your heart grieved when you realize that an attitude you have is wrong or a perception on something you have is wrong? The question is this, does your heart feel anything? The Bible says that because the love of me, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And sometimes in an evil day, in an evil society, we sometimes have the temptation to let our hearts become rocks. But don't let it happen. Take a heart test. And ask yourselves these questions. Are my heart stirred by needs? Is my heart touched to help anybody? Is my heart pricked by sin? Does my heart burn when the word of God is presented? Is my heart grieved when my attitude's wrong? My percept is wrong? And if you're having struggle in any of those areas, it's time to take some heart medicine. Just a couple simple verses here. Uh, one is this, and that is just take the word of God daily. Just daily take the word of God. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Just literally take some of the word of God daily, every day, and then also add this, add the prescription of prayer. So the Bible says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And how important it is that, that sometimes we just need to stop everything. We need to say, I'm getting cold. I'm getting hard. I'm getting beyond caring. And I don't want that to happen to me. And get away something that Pastor Mutchler said to me when I was a very young man, and he said, you know what? Get into the Word of God and read it until your heart comes to life again. And then the other thing is to spend time commuting with God because God is a person, and like any person with a relationship, God wants to hear from you, and God wants to communicate with you. Let's have a, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look at these important truths tonight, and there's so many things we can ponder, we can, we can have a steady diet of the news, and frankly, Lord, it's, it's the same every time. It's frustrating and discouraging. As we watch people say things, and make decisions because according to your word, their hearts are rocks. But you don't want us to be that way. So help us draw closer to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us look together. Let's stand together and sing this song, 534. Search me, O God. And know my heart today, number 534. 534, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Let's sing this song together. Search me. Cleansing. 
Bible comes from the 